Well, hi there, Alessandra. <laughs> I know. It's like, oh, so much energy. I'm so excited that you're here. <laughs> Thanks for being on the Author Revolution podcast and, um, you know, being a part of this crazy show. Now, you are a woman of very many talents. You do so many different things. And <laughs> I spoke a little bit in the introduction about what I know of those awesome things and um, how we met a little bit and all that good fun stuff. But for my audience, do you want to tell them a little bit more about who you are, what you do, all all that you do? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, in my in my normal life, um, I'm, I'm a wife, a mom, I've got three dogs. We live in Key West, Florida. Um, and, uh, and I started out as a reader. That was kind of how I got in this, you know, I've been one of those book nerds my whole life. Um, but I started writing 10, 11 years ago. Um, so one of my jobs is obviously as an author, I've written, uh, over 30 romance and suspense novels. I publish under A.R. Tory and Alessandra Tory. My other two jobs are uh, I run uh, Inker's Con with the team. I say I run it. I, I don't r really run it. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> you are part of it. I work, <laughs> I work with the team at Inker's Con, um, which is an author's conference and uh, and has events. And then my third third job is that I, um, I do run uh, Authors AI, which is a uh, tech startup that uses artificial intelligence to um how to categorize books and improve books through uh through the use of AI. I know Marlo. That's an awesome and AI. That's Marlo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's super that's cool. That's my favorite girl. Yeah. Yeah, right? I, I can't imagine yeah. why. <laughs> <laughs> well, so where did your what has your author's journey been like? Like where did you start when it how did you transition from being a reader into going, you know what, I want to do this as well? I have to give all of the credit to E.L. James for that. Um I did not know E.L. James at all, um, but it was it was one of those things where um, I was always a reader. I just read everything from sci-fi to thrillers. I read absolutely everything except romance. Romance <laughs> was the one thing I didn't read, um, and I was so snobby about it. I was like, <laughs> too funny. You know, romance novels, right? Um, which is totally unfounded, but that was, you know, how I was when I was 14 and then 18. Sure. But when I was 27, um, I read, 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 and I always complained about the books I read. My, I would always complain to my husband about, cause I would figure out the plot twist or whatever, you know, and I always, I always had an opinion, good and bad. Um, <laughs> but I read an article that Yale James was making over a million dollars a day on 50 shades of gray. And I was like, man, you know, I got out my calculator calculator and I was like if I could do one percent of what E.L. James is doing like I would be set for life um right. and so there there was kind of that that happened and just me starting and my husband's like you know you're always complaining about these books you should you know like put your money where your mouth is you should write something the other side of it was that my mom started writing a book like uh, somebody approached her to co-write a book she she had always been a a non like professor so, so she'd always written but never fiction so oh. she was telling me about self-publishing and how anybody could just write a book and put it out there and that like I did not have any confidence in my writing I never could have gone a traditional route because I just didn't believe in myself but self-publishing this idea that I could write a book and put it out there and nobody would know that it was me and I could do it under a pen name I was like that I could I could get on board with because sure. then if it failed horribly, no one would ever know, you know, and I, <laughs> and I wouldn't have to face like too much rejection. I could just move along and do something else. Sure. So, yeah. So it's kind of those three things. And then I also lost my job. So I was, I didn't have a job. I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and in kind of the intersection of those three things. Gotcha. And the universe was just like, well, here's this thing. Maybe you should give it a try, yeah, you know, you should give it a try. And so I wrote my first book and self-published it and it didn't do much. Like it did, it did well enough. It, I was making like, um, I was making like 15, $20 a day. Um, so it did well enough that I like got on my calculator again. And I was like, okay, if I write 10 books, you know, then I think I was, might've been making $10 a day. Cause I know if I was like, if I wrote 10 books, then I would be making roughly $38,000 a year, which is the same that I was making at the job that I had lost. So, um, so I was like, Hey, I could like never go back to work. This could be my job. So that was my expectation kind of for, if I wrote 10 books, but then three months in that book just took off. And, um, oh. 
and, and it, and I sold it for multiple six figures. And then suddenly I had all this money and it was like, okay, I, I guess this is my job now. <laughs> so right. yeah, so that was, that was way back in 2012. And that was what launched everything. Oh, that's super interesting. I started in 2010 as well, but didn't really like kick things off with my career until like 2013. So it was right mm-hmm. around that same time frame too. And it was such a different landscape when it comes to the indie publishing realm, because like KDP, um, you, KU didn't exist quite yet. It was like kind of, no, open, was I was like KDP these... select back in yeah. the day. Like, yeah, yeah, it was so <laughs> weird, right? Yeah. Oh my goodness. And I was very much like you, where it was like, I, I wrote sci-fi. I wrote, I've always written fantasy. So I had like an urban fantasy um, pen name started with sci-fi, but it, it was really urban fantasy with just a different planet. It was weird. It was, that's how all authors start in the beginning, right? We don't know what the heck we're writing. Right. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> but um, I was the same with, with romance as well, where I was just like, I don't want to do romance. No, I'm not going to do it. Now, of course, this year I'm, I'm looking at doing a, a romance pen name because there's a do you, do you ever have one of those moments where you get those ideas that come in your head and you're like, that doesn't even fit my brand. What is this? Like what, what? And it won't go away. Have you ever had those kind of ideas? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's one of mine. So that's, that's the plan for this year. I, I, yeah. I still, I still have that. Um, <laughs> I, I still ha- I have, I have a book that's been in my head for years, but every time I bring it to, to my readers, they're like, no, don't write that. And so I'm like, okay. <laughs> I guess like I they're, they're very adamant about it. They don't want to, they don't want to read it. So I'm like, okay. Interesting. You're like, yeah, new funny. pen name maybe, I guess. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. God, it's so um, weird. Readers are fun. They're fickle. They're fun, but they're fickle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to write a pirate romance and they're just not interested in that. That's, but Sam really? you know, Godwin did great with Sea of Ruin. Yeah. So maybe I just need to, yeah, find all the Sea of Ruin readers. I agree with you. I I would see nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Too funny. Readers are fun. Okay. So other than obviously being a fantastic author, you are also a self-publishing advocate, obviously with Inker's Con, which I get to speak at this year. Thank you so much for that, by the way. <laughs> I'm so excited. Thank you. And then obviously with Authors AI. So what is it do you think about indie authorship that really got you inspired to invest in helping authors to succeed and get the most out of their author career? What, what kind of was the trigger point for that? For me, it was that when I started, and again, I started in 2012, which in one, in one way was like the gold mine, like you could you know, like hit success so much easier than you could today um, because it was just much less crowded marketplace, but there was also zero resources. So like, okay. um, Every, there was no information about formatting a book. There was no information about cover design. There was no information about marketing or newsletter or any of that stuff. Um, when I got, when my book really took off and suddenly I had money and I wanted to reinvest that money into my business, I didn't, like, I was literally on the phone with the New York Times trying to get a full page ad because I didn't know how else to spend money. Like, you know, it was like, I was still stuck in, I hired a local PR person and we wasted a lot of money running like a press release and stuff like that. There just wasn't, there wasn't any information. Um, and there wasn't any, there was information on craft in terms of like a book, like writing books, but there wasn't, you know, that we didn't have online courses and we didn't have all of this stuff. So it was really kind of my first few years was I would just wander blindly in a direction until I hit a wall. And if I hit a wall, then I would turn and I'd go in another direction, you know? (laughs) Um, it was and like a labyrinth. I, I, was, I was successful despite myself, right? Like I was successful, you know, despite everything I was doing wrong. And it was one of those things that was like, once I figure all of this out, like I want to, I want to help people not make the mistakes I made. Um, and so that was, and what I really wanted was a writing for dummies. Like I wanted a four dummies class because when I, tr- I was a reader who just wrote a book, you know, and then suddenly I was trying to learn about the craft. And a lot of the craft books I read were just really intimidating. And I only got a few chapters in. And so I really wanted something kind of easy. So at first I started with my own courses, like creating courses. And then it was like, okay, I realized how little I knew. And that was when it was like, okay, I want to learn from all the people who know everything. And so that was how Inker's Con was born. It was like, let me get together the best in every single, you know, in this little niche topic and bring them all together 
and learn from those. And it was, it was as much selfish. I wanted to learn it <laughs> to this day when I create the, uh, the agenda for Inker's Con, it's like what, you know, I, I definitely gravitate towards things that I need the most, but that gets me the most excited and that I see. For sure. I, I can completely relate to that with obviously the podcast. That was kind of my, my beginning as well, where it was like, I just, mm-hmm except I was way more intimidated and trying to pull people in at first. So I spent the first, I don't know, nine months, like, I'm just going to pour out what I actually know so far sure, <laughs> before yeah. I start trying to ask people onto this show. It's scary <laughs> to ask people. Like it is. to this day, when I email people about Inker's Con, I'm like, hi, I know we don't know each other. There's this, oh, <laughs> that might, but, you know, might like to yeah. try, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry for, yeah, pumping your inbox, but yeah. Too cute. And everyone's like, heck yes, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, oh, the best part is if someone already knows what you're talking about. They're like, yeah, yeah. I've, I've... <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and Inker's Con has grown so much. I mean, even in the past so couple much. of years, yeah. it's been great. Oh my gosh. And you have such a diverse um, set of classes. <clears throat> I just went to, um, see if I can speak today, the 20 Books Conference last November. And it's like, even Inker's Con has, in my opinion, I mean, not, not to diss 20 books because it's, it's a fabulous conference, insane, but yeah. it it you have a a different mix of things and it's so cool to be able to do both and and still get a lot of really cool insightful information out of both and so it's just it's cool the way that you put things together and pull pull the panels together sometimes I mean it's just great I love it what's the hardest thing for me is that we only have 24 to 27 main classes and that is so hard for me because like 20 books they have like 80 I don't I don't I don't even know how that but six, I would say at least 60. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, and, and it's great because they have the space and they have the flexibility and they can like, so they could have really niche classes or classes just about like fantasy world building or something. But it's hard for us with Inker's Con is it's like, because I only have 27 main classes, it's like, I have to, I have to figure out like, yeah, the biggest, the biggest need and the biggest speakers we can get and the biggest that. Um, so yeah. that, that's the hardest because I, I turn away some great ideas of classes I would love to have. We just, you know, it might be, you know, KU versus wide, and that's not a big enough audience that I have, you know what I'm saying? Like that's a specific audience that wants that, but that's why, that's one of the reasons why in Inker's Con, we brought in round tables. Cause it's like, we can go nuts with round tables and round tables can be a niche topic and I could have a hundred round tables. I think we had, we had over a hundred round tables last year. Um, So they can that can go crazy. Right. And that can be super yep. niche down. So that makes me feel a little bit better. I'm like, well, I, we can't take you as a speaker, but please, please do a round table. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think that's really fantastic too. And then it, like you said, it allows people to talk about their niche topic or the, the area that they're most experienced in without it actually being like a, a full blown conversation right. or topic. That's cool. So, okay, I'm going to jump ahead because I know Inker's Con is coming up in June. So how, if people are interested in, in getting involved in Inker's Con, joining it either live or via um, the digital version, how do they go about doing that? Um, so if you visit inkerscon.com, you'll be able to see like right now, someone could dive right in and watch on demand all of the content from 2022 this year. But if you want to reserve a spot for 2023, you can. And that's, yeah, as Chris has said, we have, you can attend live in Dallas. We only have 220 slots for live. I mean, now we don't have that many, but that's how many attend authors attend. It's a smaller conference, um, but you can also attend digitally. And we normally have over a thousand digital attendees. Um, and so, uh, and it's a great, I've attended a lot of digital conferences a lot of times because I like to get ideas and find out what's working. Um, our digital ecosystem, because it is, isn't our ecosystem is the right word, but our community is so involved. Like the digital conference is not like other ones where you might sign up and you never watch the classes. Like if you want to network and meet other authors, like you're going to in that digital access. So um, they're both fantastic. I love being live and in person and, you know, getting that energy and that excitement. Um, But, uh, but it's also fantastic and live attendees attend digitally it's included. So you get both. That's super cool. Well, and it helps too, I think, for those introverted authors who really want to attend a conference, but they're kind of like, I don't really want to be there in person. And that's, <laughs> I'm, I, I, can, I don't know if I can call myself an introvert now because I've really come out of my shell being in this business and being, you know, involved in the way that I am. 
But I was, t- when I went to my first author's conference, which was um, RT in at Kansas City, Missouri in 2012 or 13, I didn't know a soul and I was terrified. I mean, I, I sat in like <laughs> against a wall and pretended to look at something on my phone and like, I didn't know anyone, you know, sure. um, and I was so shy and I still, I, I think back that every time I go to Inker's Con, because I know that, um, but that's what's nice about it being smaller is everyone meets everybody. And by the time you leave, you know, everybody's face. So it, you can't, I, I say you can't hide you, you will meet people just, yeah, just from being there. For sure. Well, I know for me, like I've been, I went to, um, the Georgia one. Oh gosh. Moonlight Magnolias way back in 2011, 2010, something like no 2011. And I was like the only sci-fi chick there. Cause all of my critique <laughs> partners were, were romance authors. And I'm like the sci-fi yeah. nerd at this conference. <laughs> and luckily I knew those two, but it was, it's, it was scary. Otherwise they kept pushing me to like, talk to people. And I'm like, why are you making me speak to people right now? Oh, the and, idea of going up to a strange group of people and saying, hi, like I, I It is though different because we all are book nerds. So we all, and we all typically are introverts. I mean, so I think, so it is different. It's not like going up to the popular group at high school and being like, you know, know, it still feels like that a little bit, (laughs) but it feels that way. It does, but then it's never as bad because I think I, at least, you know, Anchor's Con is now the only conference typically I, I travel to, but it's when you see someone who comes up, everyone's like, hi, like, come in, you know, like, yeah. do you want to wear a tiara? Like, you like know, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> come on. <laughs> hello. Yeah. <laughs> who doesn't? <laughs> I know, right? That's, it's, yeah. that's a huge, I don't even have a tiara, guys. I am like slacking. I, I, I know Book Talk has like the whole like thing going. I, <sighs> yeah, it's something that I don't even know the origins behind it. I know they do it at 20 bucks. And they have like a car. I remember seeing that for the romance group. Yeah, Yeah. I think so. And must have started uh, there. This year, with with like romance, not necessarily twenty. Right. Yeah, (laughs) I think it must be a romance thing because at Ingrid Pond, a group is like, "Is anyone bringing their tiaras?" And other people were like, "What are y'all talking about?" And (laughs) they're like, "You can bring one." So people are like last minute ordering them on Amazon. You know, you have to like design them as swag. So like, if they forget it, you can be like, "Here's here's something you can get." (laughs) There you go. There you go. I like it. Right. (laughs) <laughs> oh, too funny. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be, I was really intimidated at 20 books, even though I, I knew a lot of people and it was fun to, to network. Was it, it your first year? It was the first time I've been in person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it, well, 20, first of all, I can't say enough great things about 20 books, 20 right? books, fantastic. but it is a beat. I mean, it is huge. I've mm-hmm. never been but I've been to RWA in Vegas. The problem is you already are in Vegas. So yeah, you've already got right? like all that. And then, but it is massive. You could have a great, amazing conversation with someone and then never see them again the rest of the conference. I, I, I agree. It was so huge. And for us, we'd never been to Vegas. So I went with my husband and a good friend of ours. And it was like, you know, the whole day we went to all the different, you know, as many um, sessions mm-hmm. as we could do throughout the day and then as soon as it was done for the day we were like out the door walking the strip <laughs> trying to trying to like locate like okay what's <laughs> this we're like who where are we who am I like <laughs> we we're just trying to figure it out and so we spent hours walking every night just to get a, a good glimpse of the strip it was crazy so maybe next time it'll be it, it'll be fine but yeah. it was so hard to connect with people and we're not drinkers so it wasn't like we we're like hey let's go to all these like drinking right, mashups yeah. afterwards so it's just it was overwhelming and I go into I don't know if you do this as well but I I go into student mode and so then I'm like taking the notes and I'm all I'm all in with whatever the people are talking about that's like I don't even like think to be like oh yeah I'll miss my session let's go chat you know yeah yeah. like what what are you talking about yeah like like, I have a class to go to I need the one thing I need that like totally changes my whole career yeah right yeah (laughs) too funny Oh gosh. Okay. So we could talk about obviously conferences all day long, <laughs> but you're actually here to talk about something really cool. And so let's, let's actually get to that. <laughs> so authors, um, we've talked about this a little bit, but authors struggled at one point or another in their careers. And I know that you've mentioned that there are three big mistakes that authors can make that can end up sidelining their careers. So do you want to um, maybe tell us what those might be so we yeah, can, I can do it better. <laughs> Yes. All right. So, uh, so, the, and this is something that I, uh, a lot of these mistakes are personal mistakes I've made, but also mistakes I've seen o- other authors make. 
So, um, gosh, it's so hard. I had a list of three and then I crossed out one and put something <laughs> else. So I could really, in fact, I'm going to go wild and I'm going to maybe not go deep dive on all of them, but name as many as I can. Excellent. Because, We'd love to hear that. Why, why find other mistakes? So sure. first, um, this was one that I ended up crossing off the list, but it's still really good that they, they start their newsletter too late. Mm -hmm. Um, so I didn't have any platform when I published my first book, when I had my first big spike, I had no way to capture those. So even if it's just like a Google drive form, but there's really no reason for that. You can get a free mail or light account with free newsletter sign up uh, and, until you hit a thousand people, you don't have to pay a thing. So from very beginning, if you don't have a, a professional newsletter, just sign up at mailer light and at least get the sign up form so that you can put it in the back of all of your books. I can but, attest to that one. <laughs> yeah. But it's one of those things we put off, put off. If you can just yep. knock it out in the beginning, go for it. Um, second thing, um, giving up on your books. Um, so I, my first book, you know, it, it did okay. Like I said, it was making 10 to $15 a day. I very easily could have just like been like, you know, that was fun. Like, I'm not going to make money, real money off of this and done something else. That book, I changed the book description one day on a whim and that book then took off and that book wow. made me, you know, $60,000 that month, you know, and then, you know, Did you ever figure out what it was that you tapped into then? Was it like a trope? No. And you know, you know what? I didn't save the first one because I was oh, like, God who cares? Like, right. I didn't know this was going to be like the pivotal change that would create my entire career. You yeah. know, so I was like about to leave like out of town and I was like, you know, I think I'll just write a new book description. I think if I had to guess, I think my first, my cover was super sexy and I think my book description wasn't. And so when I changed my book description, maybe to something a little spicier that matched the cover more that fit my packaging and fit my book, then it, but it made me realize how many people were clicking on my cover, seeing the book description and being like, eh. And then they went to something else where all I, as soon as I fixed that, my sales went up like a hundred sales that day. And the next day I had 500 sales. The next day I had a thousand and it just like, like took off. And then Amazon was like, okay, this is a book people click on and buy, you know? So then they were sharing it everywhere. And it, nice. um, yeah. So, and I had the um, high honor of being the first banned book on Amazon <laughs> <laughs> because my cover was so scandalous <laughs> that uh, Amazon didn't know what to do with it because it was in the top like 15, you know, and here yeah. I am with my crotch shot cover. Uh, um, do you have a, we, we have to see this cover now yeah, for those that. of us who I are on the, the video. It. Here it is. Okay. So if you want to see this cover, guys, you got to watch the yeah, video. You got to watch the video, whatever <laughs> time we're at. This is the cover, the original cover. Oh, of okay. Of yeah, so yeah. For those of you listening, it's a woman. Her legs are spread. It's a close up of like just under her breast to like where her legs up and, and she's covering herself with her hands. So, and um, so this was a homemade cover. It wasn't anything I spent a lot of money on. This is the original. You can see how like Please. crappy it looks, but um. But the the publishers called this the crotch shot cover. Um, <laughs> and when it went to auction, it sold at auction, did great. But uh, but they called it the crotch shot cover. And it, so this is plastered all over Amazon's like, at the time they didn't, yeah. like erotica would show up in the top 100. Um, and so they finally just disappeared from sale. Like we couldn't figure out what happened to it. It took my agent like three days to get an answer. And they were like, we don't know what, to even do with this book, but we, we have to hide it. Like we can't <laughs> show it. So the only way you could buy it is if you had like the direct link. It wouldn't show up if you typed oh, in the name. So it's like the first adult filtered erotica dungeon book. <laughs> but um, it's not even but, technically that bad. I have seen way it's worse. Not, it's not that bad. Like yeah. well, there's like everything's covered. Like it's suggestive, but everything's covered. You can't see anything. Right. Um, but that was before like hand bras and then suddenly all they came up with all these rules. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but what it taught me is like, there could just be like one piece and it might be your cover and it might be your blurb. It might be the book itself, which is a much harder piece, but, um, but never give up on your book. And even, you know, there, there are books that are, that go viral three years after, you know, they're out or 10 years after they're out. So, um, so don't necessarily brand a book a loser and move on, like, you know, continue to work on it and, 
keep an eye out for it and, and root for it. Absolutely. Um, so next mistake, not writing in series. Mm. And I got to tell you, I'm a standalone girl. I read standalones. I write standalones. I've known this, this rule for years and I still write standalones. <laughs> my mind just doesn't work in series, but it has hurt me so much financially. And for me, what's really hard is I do have two trilogies, but they're both owned by publishers. So I'm not able to properly capitalize on those. Um, so if you can just connect the books in some way, you can still write standalones, but at least put them in the same town, you know, and have your characters interact with each other. Like, why didn't I do that? I could have put all my, all my standalones in the same town, you know, and at least had some reason for, you know, the, the readers from one, but no, I started with a whole new world every single time. And that's more work for you. You can't write as fast. You like a good challenge, huh? Yeah. Apparently <laughs> I like <laughs> yep. my back. So, um, so write in series at, if at all possible, um, no matter what your genre is, um, uh, ignoring the craft. That's another mistake that, um, authors make. And it's cause, you know, the marketing class, it's just like when you go to a conference, like the marketing classes are packed and nobody's sitting in the craft classes, right? Oh, but, you know, our books are our product and every hour that you spent studying craft is going to come back on you, you know, tenfold or fifteenfold. It's not a sexy, it's not an immediate return on your bottom line, but there are authors out there who do almost nothing in terms of marketing. I mean, and the book's I mean, Colleen Hoover is a fantastic example. Everyone like tries to recreate Colleen Hoover with marketing. It's it's because her books are fantastic, you know, and it's because her books hit that that thing that readers want. And she doesn't do ads and she doesn't do Facebook ads. And now, of course, she has huge, you know, publishers behind them. But those books were going nuts without any of that. Um, yep. She doesn't have a newsletter. I talk about, <laughs> she brings every role out there. She doesn't write in series, you know? <laughs> and she's like the quirkiest, weirdest person in real life. She's and then her books are so porn. serious and deep. Yeah, like what I happened? Know. Yeah. How do those books come out of that? <laughs> so, but her craft is on point. Um, so like uh, Kyla Stone was an Inker's Con presenter. She's brilliant. She's super successful. I love what she said last year, which is she reads a craft book in between every book that she finished. As soon as she finishes writing books, a book, she'll read a craft book before she writes the next one. And I was just like, I love that. Um, and you can see it, her craft, her, her books are fantastic. Um, so, uh, don't ignore the craft that that's the, the main thing. Um, and last but not least, don't jump genres. Um, and I am as guilty of this. I <laughs> was always like, oh, it, it, this is don't jump genres and write to market and do write to market. And I was so snobby about this. I was like, oh, writing to market is just like, I had this horrible image of what writing to market was. And mm -hmm. I also had this thought that I could just write just whatever floated into my head so I wrote a romantic comedy and then I wrote like a dark romance you know and then I wrote you know a psychological thriller and my readers are so like I'll get a reader who loves my books and then they look for something else like that in my backlist and I don't have anything to give them um so what do they do they go buy something else um so it's hard and especially if you're a slower writer I am now at a one book a year pace which you know I mean so I have to stay in one genre. Um, and I've done that with AR, AR Tory, my one pen name has stuck to genre, but I haven't had a choice. I have a publisher who's like, <laughs> I, I will constantly come with ideas. I'm really excited about and They're like, that's not what you write. You write domestic suspenses set in California, <laughs> you know, that have an element of, of sex or, you know, race, raciness. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, but I have this really great time travel book, you know, <laughs> that's a redemption story. And they're like, yeah, eh. you know, not going to so, fit your brand. <laughs> My yeah, that doesn't fit your brand. Yeah. So um, I've done much better about it. But if, from the beginning, if I had just, you know, stuck in my, picked a lane and stayed in it, um, I would be again, so much more successful than I am now. And it's made my job so much harder because every Every time I sell someone on my book, it's like I have to start from scratch and sell them on that book, and then I don't have anything else to sell them. So, um, so 
if you can figure out what you love writing or what you're good at writing and then and then stay there and if you absolutely also love writing something else cozy mysteries i i had i chatted with a bunch of cozy mystery authors and i left there like oh my gosh I want to write cozy mysteries. This sounds like so much fun. Like, this is amazing. Like, and then I was like, what am I doing? Like, I can't write cozy mysteries right now. Shiny, um, shiny. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but if there is something else that you also really, really want and love to do, like do it under another pen name and make sure that you have the bandwidth to support two pen names and to create production, steady production in both pen names. I completely agree with that. For me, it was like forever. I've been working on this urban fantasy pen name and I didn't, like you were saying in the beginning, you don't quite know what you're doing yet. So you hop around a little bit. Mine was like sci-fi fantasy. Then it was like paranormal fantasy. And then it was urban fantasy. And I realized that they're all urban fantasy for the most part. So we're just going to go with that. (laughs) But it was like, you're just trying to feel your way through and trying to figure out what in the heck you're actually doing. And then like, I think in the beginning when we were writing, you know, even the decade ago, like the categories weren't as concrete either. And so you don't really know, you know, like what, this is a genre, is urban fantasy even a thing? Like what, (laughs) like it was all- I remember when new adult was just kind of like invented, they were like, oh, and we'll also call this new thing that a lot of people write in, we'll call this new adult, like- (laughs) Right, yeah. Yeah. Or like RH is now um, why choose? And it's like, (laughs) there's all these like, just take a thing that was a thing and then they switch it on you and you're like, what happened what just happened here (laughs) yeah it's craziness so is my voice is leaving me today I'm laughing so much so is is there any other advice that you would give and like let's say a new author is coming on the scene and they're trying to figure out um you know what what they should really be doing is there any other advice that you would give them um my main advice would be just I wouldn't advertise until you have multiple books out. Um, Hopefully that are in a series. I mean, ideally in a series Um, and learn before you spend like, and learn before you spend time and before you spend money. Like if you are on a limited budget, invest in education um, over, you know, because it can be so easy to just throw a hundred dollars on a Facebook ad and it just be gone. You know, um, if you don't know anything about Facebook advertising, um, and, and, and you can spend a lot of money on editing and, and editing is great and editing. I would, I would put in the learn category, but if you, if you are tight on money, you don't have money for an editor, you can learn a lot through, through books. It checked out in the library through free, um, free podcasts, you know, like this, um, YouTube videos. I mean, the, the negative with free education is you also get a lot of miseducation, but, but, you know, you're never going to have piecemeal too. It's like, you're trying to find bits of in pieces and it's not as a, not in as much of a coherent delivery, I guess. (laughs) And as long as you have time, it's fine. Like that's the thing, like cheaper normally takes longer, right? So as long as you have time to watch five or six videos, you know, and, and grab something that works for you. And the other thing is like everything, things that work for one person aren't going to work for someone else, you know? So don't be like, oh my gosh, I have to be an outliner because these three people are outliners and they, whatever, or I have to rapid release because that's whatever, like, you don't have to do anything. Like you can blaze your own trail and it includes a little bit of Melanie Harlow and it includes a little bit of Freedom McFadden and it includes a little bit of this and something that you heard outside the elevator at 20 books. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Your path and you're in that and, you know, and that's you. So, because I am not an outliner, I would, I understand why outlining is great. Like I want, just like I want to be organized and have a nice looking house. Like I (laughs) want to be an outliner, but I'm not, I'm going to have a messy house. It's going to happen. And I'm going to pants a book. It's going to happen, you know? So, um, you know, just, just understand and embrace that. And some of us work, I, um, Becca Smine is fantastic. If you can ever watch anything that Becca Smine does or attend any of her classes, she has courses too, but if you can't afford that, if you can find her at conferences and things like that, she's been at Inker's Con a ton of times and she's brilliant. And she taught me that I need a deadline. Like Mm -hmm. if I don't have a deadline, it books just, it's not going to get written, you know, it, I mean, yeah. it will get written, but it's going to take a year and a half, you know? So I, and no matter what my deadline is, I'm going to wait until 
<laughs> two weeks before. <laughs> yeah, two weeks before. And then I'm going to be that crazy person in my office. Like, don't come in here. Like, what are you doing? No, I can't like eat dinner. I'm on deadline. Right. You know? That's <laughs> Parkinson's law. But yeah. like, whatever you have will expand or contract to fit the time allotted for it. <laughs> Yeah. Deadlines are, are key, <laughs> but don't go crazy. Come on. You got to eat. <laughs> yeah. I asked my publisher for an extension, my poor publisher, like I am self-published, but the last few books I've done has been with uh, a pub, which is Amazon publishing, which is almost like indie publishing. Like they're so different from every other traditional publisher. But, um, I know now I've, I'm worried that I've trained them now that I'm going to ask <laughs> for the extension. Um, but the, so I asked, for an extension because I um I I had finished the book and I hated it and I was like I have to start so anyways so but uh, anyways I was down I was like hey I just need like five six more days you know whatever and the lady was like what about three weeks and I was like awesome like <laughs> yes three weeks would be fantastic what did I do the first two weeks of that like I didn't even <laughs> look at the manuscript <laughs> Like suddenly I have all this time. I deadline. You know what you like, did? You let it I, percolate in the back of your mind before you went through. to it. Yeah. So I'm like organizing stuff and like actually going out and doing stuff. And then suddenly I'm like, oh my gosh, I have seven days. Like, what am I going to do? And then I was a crazy person for the seven <laughs> days. Um, so yeah. I think that's pretty, t pretty standard for a lot of us. I'm the same way when it comes to deadlines. If I don't have it, like, even if it's just a mental deadline, if I don't have one, I can very easily fill my time with other things. And so it's like, it's so weird, but it, it's crucial. It's really like crucial. Like you said, the time expands or contracts, right? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I can't wait for Inkercon, Inkerscon too. It's going to be such a fun thing to do. And I'm doing it right after going to the Idaho Writers Conference with Troy Lambert. So that's oh, going to be crazy. Yeah. It's going to be like, I'll be there. And then all of a sudden I'll be in Texas. It's going to be like, where I won't even know who I you're am gonna, or where I live. Your brain is going to be like humming. <laughs> yeah. Right. Life. Yeah. It's going to be so exciting. I'm, I'm so, we haven't, obviously COVID, we haven't traveled yeah. a super ton until last year when we went to Vegas. And so I'm so stoked to be finally out and moving about again. <laughs> It's so funny. A lot of people, like I've talked to people who've never been to an author's conference and it's um, like, it just, I don't know. It gives me like a shot of inspiration. Like I just, yes. I don't know. It's, it's just cool. It's just really, I mean, cool is such a weak term, but it's, um, it's just, you have to experience it at some point in time. You do. It's, it's, it's like this motivating, even if you aren't quite sure what you're doing yet, or even if yeah. you're just like trying to figure things out, it's like just being around the energy of all those people, whether they are successful or they're just starting out. It's like, we're yeah. all here for the same purpose of like learning how to do this better. And it's just so cool. Like you said, it's so cool to be there. It's just, it's neat. I love the experience of it. And it's also you like setting aside that time where it's focused, right? Because the negative is if you get a course or something else is you can, you know what I mean? Like there isn't yeah. like urgency where right. you're, you're here. So you're like, I'm going to set aside this 72 hours and, and I'm, it's my gift to myself and I'm going to focus on my books and, and just immerse myself in this for these 72 hours. And so you have this kind of like laser focus on your career and your books for that period of time, which is also what I need, you know? Absolutely. It builds that momentum where you, yeah. you know, all of your thoughts, regardless of what you're doing, when you're thinking about something, it builds that momentum. If you've spent mm -hmm. a couple of seconds, even 17 seconds, they say yeah. is like enough to create momentum of thought. And so when you immerse yourself into the weekend of it, it's, it's no surprise to me why yeah. all of a sudden you're like motivated and excited to do this thing because you've just spent so much time immersing like you said into the world of what you want to be doing and you're reminding yourself I think that this is an important piece of your life and that yeah. you want this to become you're telling bigger. the universe I care about this yes. yeah I'm paying attention on this absolutely <laughs> Well, Alessandra, thank you so much for being on the podcast, for sharing all of your insights and telling everybody about InkersCon. We'll have to come back again when we get closer to InkersCon and talk more I about know. just that. <laughs> but we could do like, we could do a recap after it where we yeah, talk about like that. our favorite takeaways. I like, I like doing that in between um, the live event and the digital launch, because then it's not too late. People can still jump in for the digital launch, but also everything's kind of top of mind, yes. you know? Um, so yeah, I'd love to come back anytime, but yeah, thank you that. so much for having me.
For sure. Thank you so much. Now, before we go, though, if um, my audience wants to obviously get in touch with you, learn about your books, about InkersCon, Marlowe, all those fun things, how do they go about like finding you? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, alessandratore.com is where re- is my reader site. So you can find all my books there. Um, and, uh, and if you need a book, Every Last Secret, or the ghost writer. If you're a, 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 actually forget that the ghost writer, if you're an author, this is it behind me. Um, the ghost writer, if you're an author is it. my, first of all, it's my best book I've ever written, but it's also like writers love it. Cause the main character is a writer. Love um, it. So, and, um, and if you go to inkerscon.com, there's a blog there that has a bunch of, we have free webinars. You can jump in and watch. Um, and, uh, and you can find out anything about any events we have going on. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it so much. And I, I am just thrilled to, to be coming to Texas. I can't with... wait to yeah, see you in person you. in just yeah. a couple months. It'll be here before we know it. I know it's scary. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm already scared, but that's okay. We'll we'll do good. <laughs> well, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much.